Continuing on now with our exploration of Renaissance and Baroque painting, we're looking at a sculpture now of Lorenzo de' Medici. Uh, if you will remember from the last lecture, he was the richest man in Europe. And this is his grandson, Cosimo I, <coughs> in a painting by Bronzino. He was the Grand Duke of Tuscany, and he was made the Grand Duke by his uh, uncle, Leo X, who was a child of Lorenzo de' Medici, who became the Pope. This is his wife, Cosimo's wife, Eleanor of Toledo, uh, in a beautiful dress that I once saw a replica of uh, on a lady in a reenactment who had sewn it herself. This is their daughter, Bia, who uh, died young, and this is a posthumous portrait that was painted by Bronzino. Here we have a portrait of Maria de' Medici. She became the Queen of France, and even though she's a young girl in this portrait, she's painted as a much older woman um, because this portrait is in anticipation of this marriage and was probably sent to the royal uh, family in France to consider her marriage to their prince. And here she is as a young woman, already married to the prince, and here she is as the Dowager Queen. So if you were a Medici, you could uh, become a Pope, you could become a Grand Duke, you could marry into the Royal Family of France. Here we have a painting called Cupid, Venus, Time and Folly. This painting is an allegory and it's telling a story and we're going to explore what that story is. In the center we see a lush nude and uh, this is a nude of Venus. We can tell because she's holding her attribute, which is the golden apple. She's being embraced by Cupid who is um, her son, and he's the one who shoots arrows at people and makes them fall in love with someone. And she's slipping an arrow out of his quiver, so we know that this is about love. But uh, what kind of love is it about? <coughs> well, uh, looking to the right, we have a little puto, or a cherub, who's running past, about to throw a handful of roses over this scene, and he's representing folly. If we look behind him, we have uh, the key to this painting, uh, to the story. We have a pretty little girl, and in her uh, hand in front of her, she's holding out a honeycomb, uh, representing the sweetness of love. And behind her, she's holding a scorpion in her hand, representing the sting of love. So we can assume that this is a kind of love that um, is dangerous. If we look above, we see an older man uh, with a white beard, and he's pulling this cloth back, revealing this scene. So this is something um, about this kind of love that's revealed over time. And if we look um, in the lower right, we see masks. So this uh, is representing a, a kind of false love. And if we look in the right, uh, behind the figure of Cupid, we find a person with their hand over their head and they're screaming and this uh, is representing madness. So this is uh, some kind of love that's uh, very seductive in the beginning and becomes very painful in the end. You can decide what that is. Here we have a painting of the artist Sofonispa Anguissola painted by her teacher Bernardo Campi. Anguissola was born in 1532 and lived a very long life until 1625. The usual way that painters trained was to be uh, an apprentice as a, a boy in the studio of the master. And for a girl, this wasn't really an option because the young boys would uh, live in the studio of the master and it uh, that young women needed to be in a chaperone situation according to the social mores of the time. So uh, Sofonispa got her education with Bernardo Campi as um, a guest living in his house with her two sisters. So there were three Anguissola sisters who were supervised by the wife of Bernardo Campi living in their home. This is a self-portrait of uh, Anguissola working at her easel. As a young woman she uh, caught the eye of an ambassador to Spain and through this uh, association she became a lady-in-waiting to the Queen of Spain and also a portrait painter to her. It was a very unusual situation for uh, an artist. But as a young noblewoman, it was uh, entirely apropos that she would be a lady-in-waiting. Here is a drawing that she did before she left for Spain when she was uh, working informally with the artist Michelangelo. 
he uh, looked at a drawing that she had of a girl laughing and he said, yeah, drawing of a girl laughing, that's good. We usually don't have people uh, showing emotions in drawings, but how about a picture of a boy crying? That would really be exciting. So she took uh, his advice and she went home and did this drawing of a little boy, her brother, uh, reaching into a basket of crabs and being bitten by one. This drawing, though, in uh, distress condition today was much celebrated at the time and helped to contribute to uh, Anguissola's fame. This is Anguissola's most famous painting. It's a painting of her sisters playing chess and it shows her interest in human expression and human drama. We see the sister on the left is checkmating the other sister who's holding up her hand yielding and then we have a sister in the middle who's laughing at her sister who just lost. Um, in the corner we have a figure that was painted in later who was a governess <coughs> of the family. This painting was to start a trend in art towards a more naturalistic expression. Here we have a painting of the artist's sister uh, after she's taken vows as a nun. Sometimes these uh, young women had a calling for this occupation and sometimes they were simply parked there, particularly young noble women like the Angus Angisola family couldn't <coughs> just be running around on their own. It wasn't considered socially acceptable then the way it is now. Here we have a portrait in uh, the series of portraits that Angisola did as a member of the royal court. <coughs> she uh, painted Elizabeth of Valois who was the great great granddaughter of Lorenzo de Medici and the daughter of Catherine de Medici, who was another queen of France, married to Henry II. This queen married Philip of Spain. And uh, this is a very detailed portrait, <coughs> especially in the clothing. We see the points that are used to tie the sleeves together. Here's another portrait that Anguissola did of a princess of the court who, in spite of losing an eye, didn't lose her beauty. And here is a portrait of the Infantas of Spain, which were the children of the king and queen. These princesses of the royal house were usually married to uh, create alliances with people that the royal family wanted to be on good terms with. <coughs> After 20 years as a court painter, Anguissola returned to her home country. She was briefly married towards the end of her term as a lady-in-waiting, but her husband died. So she was a single woman again on the ship on the way back and she took a fancy to her ship captain and they married and had about 50 years of uh, wedded bliss together. Here's a portrait that Anguissola painted by commission of a condottiere, a professional soldier. And here's a self-portrait of her late in life, the lady who changed the face of painting from something very formal to something that could explore human nature and the human situation. In spite of the fact that Anguissola had to do these very formal portraits in the court of Spain, she's best remembered for these kinds of informal portraits that she did of her family. And now we look at the Dutch painter Franz Hals, who uh, has taken up this thread of informal portraiture, and we have a man playing a lute. And here's a, a very famous Franz Hals painting, The Merry Toker, where a man is uh, holding out his drink to us and expounding with his rosy cheeks uh, enhanced by the drink. Here we have a wedding portrait and instead of uh, the very formal portraits that we saw in Italy in the Renaissance, now we have a couple sitting together, lounging together. The gentleman is slouched back in his seat and the lady would probably be slouched except she's wearing a corset and she can't really uh, slump any more than that and they're smiling. And here's another Franz Hall's portrait of uh, an actor giving a speech. It looks like Hamlet uh, delivering his Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest. And we have uh, very naturalistic lighting and the actor is speaking and it seems as though he's in the room with us. Here we have a self-portrait of Franz Hall's. He looks like a nice guy. He was born in 1580 and uh, lived until 1666.